If you're a full-time faculty member, you have this opportunity to take a class, a class that you teach, a class that you have expertise in, and see if it, if it lends itself to an international travel experience for roughly around two weeks, right? This class is gonna be offered in the summer. So be thinking about not necessarily in the fall semester because you're gonna be teaching other classes in the fall semester. You're gonna be teaching other classes in the winter semester. So this is a class that you're gonna offer and teach, class that you teach in the summer that you get to work with a provider who are the logistic engineers. They're gonna be helping you get all of your lodging, your hotel, all your transportation, your meals in some cases, uh, depending on your itinerary and your activities. You're gonna uh, contract with them to set all of that stuff up for you based on your idea of how those activities align to your curriculum of your class. I'm Chef Heckwolf. I've been facilitating trips with Chef Ahmed for about five years, know, four years, five years. And we go to uh, France, Germany, and Italy. I'm Sherry Knappers with nursing. And I think I've been doing this nine years. 2011, I think was my first trip. And we've always gone to Costa Rica. I'm Sean Mackey. Uh, I lead a trip to Spain to hike the Camino de Santiago in the northwest corner of the country. And uh, prior to that, I did work uh, as a support person with Hillary Haney on her trip to Morocco. And I've also been a support person on two trips to Ghana with GVSU and their study abroad uh, program there. So that's what I do. I am Professor Kimberly Overdevest and I teach art history at the college and I was just thinking about how long it's been since I've been doing this and I think I started about eight years ago and I first started just like um, Sean did. I started first as a support person with Hilary Haney um, with our trip to France and then from there um, she and I co-led a group to France and Brussels, Belgium, and the, the Loire Valley. Um, and then I um, led a trip to um, New York City. And then um, last summer, summer of 19, I led a trip to Italy. With Spain, uh, yeah, those those epiphany moments when they, they're, it, even pre-trip, uh, I do a ton on packing. I try to get my students to be one bag travelers so they can travel the world in a small school sized backpack. And they all just shake their head and say, there's no way. And then before we go and they've got it all packed, they feel like they can kick ass. I mean, they are really excited about the fact that they did it. Uh, and then when we get there, the feeling of hiking, you just hike 20 miles, you hike 20 miles a day before, and you hike 20 miles a day before that, something happens to them where they realize that they are capable of much more than they ever thought possible, physically, mentally, intellectually. Uh, you can't teach that. It has to happen when they get that moment of, holy crap, I walk across this country on my own two feet, and uh, I'm here now only by my sheer will, and I have blisters or I have chafing or whatever. Those are badges of honor at that point. It all kind of centers around how much the students get out of it, how they so much appreciate what they have at home when they come back from the shanty towns how much the clients appreciate the students' work and how the students are amazed at how appreciative they are because they have so little and they feel like they as students didn't do that much for them and yet the appreciation from the clients is just so huge for them. And in looking back when the students do their reflective journals and we meet afterwards and stuff, um, they all talk about how amazing it was, how life-changing. In my Italy trip, I had a student 
that has always wanted to do that and uh, to go abroad and she just had extreme fear. Um, she also had a high degree of anxiety and uh, she also was lacking in confidence and and she but her love of art really wanted to take this trip and so what's interesting is that um, when we got there in Italy I tried to help her unpack her emotional baggage so to speak um, and it's amazing within two days how she realized that her fears were unfounded. And we've always gone to Costa Rica. And the main rationale for that was that um, we wanted to keep it in a Spanish speaking country because if students were gonna be exposed to another language, we wanted it to be the one that would be most useful for them back home. So that limited our search as far as just Spanish speaking, which obviously there's a lot. And then with, um, when I first started doing the trips and obviously there's a lot going on even now, um, there were a lot of safety concerns with different parts of Central America and Mexico. And Costa Rica is the safest destination but there's still a very needy population. There's shanty towns, a lot of Nicaraguan immigrants. And so we just figured if we kept with a country that we knew was very stable, but still had a great need, we could meet the students' needs, um, get them exposed to Spanish, but then not have the year-to-year -year worries about, is there a revolution? Is there drug violence and all of that? And um, so Costa Rica has worked out really well for us. Students are a little bit more focused on Italy, France, Germany for food right now. So while food's international, it's all over, we also try to pick places that we know students will have interest in and be excited about. And hopefully that kind of sparks them for maybe future travel to some of these more exotic places. For what I was trying to do uh, as a teacher is look at ways to take literature, I teach uh, literature, pop literature or um, poetry. I was trying to take literature and figure out a way to make it alive, right? Outside of, you know, some dead person wrote this, why should we care about it? Or why historically should we read some of these texts that are hundreds of years old? Or even some new texts, you know, that just came out, why should we care? Because it's, it's not weighted with the baggage of history yet, right? So I was trying to find ways to make that work. And one of the ways to do that is connect place to the literature that we're studying or connect literature to an experience that someone's having. And that's really what I'm trying to do with my study away program. So I really kind of think about, um, first of all, where are the art hubs? And second of all, what would students like to see? So that kind of guides, guides my, um, guides my idea where I want to go. But the provider does all the coordination of your trip. So if you have a good provider, they are meeting you at the airport, they are meeting your group, they're handling the transport, they are a translator along the way, and they are with you usually on every um, group outing that you have. And quite honestly, because our trips are food-based, we've had a lot of luck with our providers and our liaisons from city to city that they hang out with us the entire time, which is really nice and benefits students because on the free time, like students are going to eat or they're doing really fun activities. So the providers have stayed with us the entire time. So they are kind of your safety person. They're a resource if you have specific questions about how public transportation works, um, where is a good place to find this, uh, oh, we have students that have blisters. Where is a drugstore? Like they are able to help with all of that. So they're kind of holding your hand and guiding you the entire way. And that's why it's really important to have a strong third party, one that communicates well. So just like what Kimberly had said, communication all year round. It's just not that you're commuting, you know, here and there, we have communication all the time with them to confirm different activities and give our input. And to also have a third party provider that you can kind of tell them what went well and what didn't go well. It, and so as you move forward, you can uh, make those changes. 
really try to look at your budget um, with that guide because some places obviously are cheaper or, or, or not. It's not simply choosing the cheapest budget proposal you get. You want to make sure that you are getting the service that you need to have this trip be successful. You could go and take your family or you could take, you know, 10 people that are your friends and go do this trip without a guide or without anything. And they would be patient enough and, and deal with you enough if something went wrong. But when you have 20 students there who have a very limited amount of time and if something goes wrong, you're paying for when the guide comes in and all the examples you gave, uh, you know, to come and help you, to assist in some way. Um, so just be careful of that. Don't always go with the cheapest program. In the nursing, they do um, dental and just general health, and they do some other stuff that's more generic, but it's all based on service learning, which is really cool. And it's especially nice because the course that I teach for the trip is on campus a service learning course so it was really neat to not only i knew it was going to be service learning because of what we were going to be doing but that that's an emphasis of the provider too and like you guys are saying having a good provider and this is part of where when i was talking before about knowing that i'm the students are paying a little bit more but they're getting more i'm sure there are other providers that would be decent but this is one of those they pick you up at the airport they are with you i mean our team leader is with us 24 7 period and then we have additional support for our clinic days and depending on how large the group is, um, additional translators and sometimes there's like a, a second team leader, especially if we split into two clinical groups. So um, they're just amazing. And they also help us plan our rec days. And because I've been working with them since 2011, after checking the references from several other faculty across the country, um, that we have a really good relationship of you know, our students don't really need that. I know you do this with most groups, but it doesn't work, we don't need it. And this works really good and we like this area better. And so, um, yeah, that relationship with the provider is huge and the longer you have it, the better the relationship, especially too, because a lot of times the same staff is there for us. So, you know, I've had one or two of the same team leaders almost every year and a lot of the same translators. Sometimes we'll get the same docs working at clinics and it's it's just really neat and it's cool for the students too when we show up and they recognize me and we greet each other and the students just are so much more comfortable knowing that we have that relationship so yeah the relationship with the provider is huge starts well over a year in advance so you're really looking ahead because the proposal starts the process starts in December or probably in October because the first documents are due from faculty in December and that would be for almost a year and a half away right the following mm -hmm. May or the following summer so once we've turned in the, the initial proposal and that gets kind of the okay from the college and that is a process within itself, then we start with the extended or um, official proposal. So there's a pre-proposal and then you have the actual proposal, which is a multi-page document that talks about your experiences, why you wanna do this trip, what, what the destination is and covers an entire budget. And then that gets, that goes to another, or through another approval committee at the college as well. As you're building your course, really look at your curriculum, meet with Katie Daniels, look at how your uh, activities, how those tie in with assessments, how you're getting this done, because at the end of the day, your proposal is not going to get approved if it just looks like a fun trip. There's a whole other set of pedagogical and curricular concerns when you now go from face to face to study away. They have, it, and you need to spend some time familiarizing yourself with that, reading some of the scholarly text and, and realizing that before you even start your lesson design, your design of the whole course. It's really about managing the time. So Sasha and I, we start pretty early. We're always doing something. We have weekly meetings almost all year round, actually. I mean, not in the summer, but throughout the academic year we meet and sometimes those meetings are filled with more work and sometimes they're just kind of connecting or talking about things we want to change in our study away or new assignments or improvements.
what is your plan of how you're how you're going to connect with students um and i think we all have different ways that we're able to do that and have had some really great experiences or great ideas of how to do that and i think again it's a little bit unique based on the curriculum and also the trips focus for my trip i need 50%, I know that 50% of the people who I approve for the trip, who go through everything, who interview, fill out the application, meet with me, even start the paperwork, I know that 50% of them will back out of the trip before the time actually goes. And that's due to so many reasons, just life, right? Someone loses a job, can't get money, uh, something happens. And preparing for that ahead of time is really helpful. So you're not thinking of, oh, I need to recruit you know, 20 people, I need to recruit 40 or 50 people. Sasha and I literally tend to like hit the streets, so to speak. We have visited class, every single class in our program before, because again, we're doing a culinary trip. So while it's not only open to our students, it typically fills very quickly with our students who have that interest because that's what they're in school for. And we have actually had great success with that. What we have done in more recent years is we will actually, again, go out to kind of meet the students and we will set up our own informational tables and we kind of schedule it when we know classes are going to be walking in the hallways, so to speak. And that has been very, very helpful for us. I do think that the study of Wayfair uh, that we do does bring us some but it only works if we, as Study Away facilitators, bring our courses there. The other thing that worked for me is direct email. Is I would email students and say, hey, here's our trip. Contact us if you want some information about it. I think that's uh, that direct mail campaign worked best for us, and we'll continue to do that. If you are <laughs> aware of Mongoose as a text-to-email software, uh, you should definitely use it. Our department has it because we kick butt. and. Um, that was the number one way that we got people. Get over the fear, just like I was talking about with my students before, just do it. Um, you are gonna provide, not only are you gonna provide your students an experience that will, will be life altering for them, but but you as a professor um, will also get a life-altering experience. If you're interested as faculty, go on one of the trips first, because I think it will um, really show you how the trips can be. It's, it's, um, it's something that um, allows us to reach our students that we cannot simply do in a white box classroom. We just can't. I think I can speak for any of us that any of us would um, sit down with any faculty member that hasn't done before and be more than willing to walk it through.